started, I want to talk about something new. Um, I also want to remind us, we're kind of skipping some examples in the book. And so there's a really good example using the, the range and the mid-range. And so work through that problem. We might come back around to it. We'll certainly allude to that problem. But I think it's detailed pretty nicely in the book. The, the hardest part of that problem is just um, doing the transformation and figuring out where the bounds live between the mid and the between the range and the mid-range. You draw a diagram for you. If you guys want a calculus lesson, Thursday is a really good time for that. And so it really is just a calculus exercise, multivariate transformation. Um, I can provide full lectures on how transformations work. Lots of different ways to think about it. It's all just the fundamental theorem of calculus to me. Um, or any of those examples that appear in the book. So sometimes I talk about that example and I think it can be a little bit of a mind bender for a moment. And what is the take home point of that example? Or are they trying to teach you in it? I think there's lots of valuable lessons in there. So read through those. I'm going to skip ahead to the delta method. And so we've been talking a lot about probabilistic techniques. And with this, we're going to get an inferential technique. Get something we can use. So we'll make a probability statement like we've been making. So CLT is a probability statement about the means. We're going to do something about transforming things like means, things that follow central limit theorems. Um, and then we're going to show you how to use this. So those are two different things. But I think for central limit theorem, just going back, what do you do with CLT? Well, you say probably in some sense, whether you're a Bayesian or a non-Bayesian, you're going to make some statement like x bar is close to mu, the truth. And how you conceptualize what that means might be a little bit different. How far away from the truth you are? Well, whether you're a Bayesian or a non-Bayesian, you're probably going to say something like sigma squared over n. So maybe sigma over root n, if you like to think in that unit scale. And so, and if you like thinking in terms of probabilities, you might say plus minus two of those. So sigma over root n. And so that's how far away I am. So you're kind of taking this probability statement and turning it into an obvious inferential tool to say something about the mean. The delta method is like that. I want to remind you just about Taylor's theorem. And so the delta method is just this approximation technique that invokes Taylor's theorem. So let me say it one more time, and I'll tell you everything about the delta method. The delta method is the first order approximation for approximating something. And if things that we're doing the first order approximation to follow the central limit theorem, then we get these um, variances in means that we can compute using that first order Taylor approximation. A little soft. Let me put it in writing. So before we do it, let's just remind what Taylor says. So it's just some function. Approximated by some polynomial. Like this, this is the ith derivative. And I'm going to center it somewhere. It's just a first order approximation to things. 
So back in the 60s, you could probably just tell somebody that because that's what you did all the time. Oh, yeah, of course. The thing I always forget, the I factorials. So easy to forget things. I'll tell you even in the delta method what I always forget in the calculation. I think I missed it on my midterm too. Okay. So anyway, just Taylor's approximation. And the remainder I'll write down Rx is equal to Gx minus Prx is small if you usually just look at two terms. So G R plus 1 centered at alpha, x minus alpha raised to the R plus one, and to remember it this time, or plus one factorial, divided by g, or the derivative, centered at alpha, divided by r factorial, x minus alpha to the r, is less than one. So when this thing starts getting big, i.e. the terms in the remainder, are bigger than the terms in your approximation. That's bad. And so, and you can make lots of statements about how close you are to the truth. How many terms do you need? And you can look at just the R plus first term to analyze that. And obviously, is a function of x. So there's little things I can move around in here. And so, where do I center my approximation? All kinds of good questions. Just in a nutshell, where do you center your approximations? What do they teach you? Zero. Yeah, maybe zero. You like zero because that's a nice number. Anybody have any other answers? How about negative 17 because it's just as arbitrary? Negative one bazillion. It's as arbitrary as zero. So why zero? Well, maybe if I'm doing theorem proving, it doesn't matter so much. So a lot of times when we're asked to take limits, and there's a couple homework problems you'll see in this homework set that kind of the, the key is to take a Taylor approximation and then take the limit and see what it does. These problems where you're like, I don't know what the limit does. Take the Taylor approximation and then take the limit. So sometimes I use Taylor's theorem just as a theoretical device. And I don't really care where I center things so long as when I take the limit, I get the result that I want. And so, but if I were gonna use this as a real tool and approximate something with it, and I wasn't just in class with a piece of chalk, I might wanna be more thoughtful about that answer. So where do you center your approximation? Where do you, does it matter? Zero, the answer zero is kind of a inclination that maybe it doesn't matter at all, but it does. Has ever actually used one of these things, or is it just calculus problems? Okay, here's that easy answer. If you want to approximate close to some number, you center it there. So center it where you intend to approximate. Now, of course, that doesn't help you a whole lot because the zero of derivative, when I have this to the zero, we're just getting back g of where it's centered. And so just plugging it in, it's as we start moving away from that value that Taylor's approximation becomes valuable for us. So where can I evaluate the things and where do I want to evaluate everything? So just some statements we already know or presumably once did. Okay, so that's Taylor's. We're going to use that. Now I'm going to do everything in scalar form and I'll allude to the multivariate form that they use in the book. And I'll tell you what those little analogs are. So, but I want you to consider a random variable. I'm 
going to call it T. And I'm going to say it has mean theta. In my example that I'm going to be doing first, this is just a scalar. And that's just a scalar. In the book's example, where they start out, they make that a vector. Okay? It doesn't really change all that much. Put some bolding in there. We have to watch covariances and not just variances. So I'll tell you what they're doing in the book, but I'm going to write it all down first, just in the scalar form. OK, so consider. a transformation not interested in T but rather I'm interested in GT so some function of T we do this all the time not interested in that thing and I like to take a function of it and then it means something to me and so certainly when I Take a transformation of a random variable and change the distribution. So no surprises there. So I'm going to approximate this. And I'm going to say this is going to be, and I'm going to approximate it using Taylor. And so if I approximate this function using a Taylor approximation, I have two choices to make. How deep into the approximation do I want to go? What's the order of the approximation? And where should I center it? Let me ask you guys. Where would you center this Taylor approximation? Fatal. So there we go. So center it around where maybe the mass of the distribution is. And so if you center your Taylor approximations where there's not a lot of mass, guess how good of an approximation it's going to be? Not as good. And so if I center it where there's a lot of maps, it's probably better. Okay, so that's the idea. So I'm going to center it here. So center is the mean. And this is almost intuitive, but there's a little bit more to it. It also has a nice mathematical convenience. So I'll just say first derivative. just the first order technique. I've chosen theta, and so I plug it in here. I'll divide by one factorial and not write that down. T minus theta. And so that's true. They're approximately the same. How good? <laughs> Don't know. So hard to say. But basically, in the delta method, this is what they do. That's the delta method in a nutshell. If they use this approximation. Now we're going to say something about T. This approximation is good when T has some properties. Okay, so we'll get to it. But this is just a first order approximation. Okay, the book makes this just slightly more complicated. The book does that. Book has T is equal to T1 to TK. This is just a vector of random quantities. So this is just a multivariate. Random variable. Okay, K things I don't know in a system. And they don't put too many conditions on this, they just say that they know the means of them all. So, with means, theta, and they cap this thing right here. So, theta equal to theta 1, theta k. k random variables, there's k means. And then they build the first order approximation around this. And you may or may not have seen that before. 
Does anybody know how you take a Taylor approximation in high dimensions? You look at all of their first derivatives, their partial derivatives. You look at all their second order partials, mixed partials. So the second order approximation has a lot of terms floating around in it. Third order approximation has all of those mixed triplets. And so and they build sums out of those. Here's the first order approximation. So GT. And don't be too confused by this. I take a lot of things, I plug it into the function, and I get one thing back. Okay, so GT is a scalar, just a thing. I plug something into it, but T is multivariate. And so this is G theta plus, and I need a little bit of notation, I'll say, down here, and this is going to be the i partial derivative. So just a dash there for derivative. Which derivative did I take? Well, I took it with respect to the i random variable. Plug in theta. powers right here and this is going to be pi goes from 1 to k first order so hardly a steeper concept I've got all these derivatives in all the different case direction and if I look at those individual terms right here so that's just a scalar value that's a scalar value right here if I wanted the second order thing, I would have all of the second order derivatives computed next to quadratic terms. So that's the multivariate analog of everything. You can read through that in the book. I'm probably not going to ask you too many questions about it. So this and this are the same if k is 1. So that's what the book does. Get rid of that. We'll come back around to it. We'll see what all the multivariate results are. These are basic probability results. As we move from our first calculus class to our second calculus class. Okay, so first order approximation, and this is the delta method. Some people call it the first order delta method, which means there must be a higher order delta method, and we'll talk about that. That's also in the book. But right now, we're going to start out just first order, and then we'll see why this second order thing comes up. I'll give you a head start. It's not to get a better approximation. It's when this method fails. And so it's not just increase the number of terms and you get a better approximation. I'll tell you why soon we do not do that. So. Basically, first order approximation, that's it. So let's just look at a couple results. Using our first order approximation, Anytime you see this, somebody's telling you it's approximately true, 
I can say anything's approximately true. We want to know if it's actually close. So we'll get there soon. We'll start working with limits soon, and we'll show that everything converges very nicely. So something very nice happens right here. This is expectation of G theta. Like this. It's equal to G theta. I can just pull that out. So it has nothing to do with T. Keep in mind, this expectation operator is operating on the only random thing in the equation. T. So plus G prime theta expectation of T minus theta. This is zero. And so we didn't just center it at theta because that was a massy part. We liked that that goes away. So this is just g theta. Seems pretty good. So we have a relationship. This is approximately equal to that. We actually know a little bit more. If I told you g was a monotone or a convex function, you could actually say whether or not this was less than that or greater than that. What's that called? Jensen's inequality. So we kind of see a relationship with Jensen's inequality right here. We're not putting a, a direction on an inequality. We're just saying it's about equal. Oh, and I'll mention the multivariate analog here. Just expectation of G cap T is approximately expectation of no expectation G cap theta. No surprises. Same thing happens in all those expanded linear terms, the expectation slides over and turns them all into zeros. Okay, now the next obvious question. Maybe we can work through the variance of GT. I'll just write down the definition. This is gonna be GT minus G theta should write this down, expectation of GT. You actually do that real quick in the book, and they don't tell you in every line where they make an approximation. But that's what variance is. Now let's start approximating. minus g theta squared. So that's an approximation, the first move they make in the book. Because we just took this result, and we plugged it in. They're not equal to each other. So, and then I'm gonna Taylor expand that thing. Using my first order, my clumsiest Taylor expansion. Theta minus plus G prime theta T minus theta minus G theta. Square all that out. We get a nice cancellation right there. So this first order stuff's kind of cool because a lot of things cancel real nicely. We're left with very little. So this is equal to expectation g prime theta t minus theta squared, which is equal to, I'm going to factorize out the g prime theta squared. That can just come out. It's just a constant times the variance of t. comes out 
expectation of t minus theta squared, you recognize that as variance, what variance is. So this thing, under our first order approximation, is as close, approximately, we need to say something about that, a scale of the original variance. How do I scale everything? I take a derivative of my transform, I plug in my centering parameter, theta, and I square that thing. It's going to tell you things I always forget to do, like divide by i factorial when I write on the board, or on tests, I always forget to square that for some reason. So, start doing the calculation. I did the derivative, boom, I did the hard part. Plug it in, multiply by variance of t minus 5. Shucks. You know, got to square. I won't be quite so cute, but remember to square. Okay, the multivariate version of this, pretty similar to everything we've seen already. So, a multivariate version. said that they were all independent of each other, this equation would be a little bit simpler. But I kind of like that they're not independent of each other. And so, looks just kind of like this thing over here, but I'm going to have a big sum of g prime i centered at cap theta variance of ti i goes from 1 to k, and then I have the covariance terms. So i less than j, and this is going to be g i prime theta g j, j derivative, i partial, j partial. And we centered at the same place times the covariance. How do you get that? You go right back to this equation and you square everything out. And you look at how that square evolves, and that's where all these little terms come from. And so, and if that's confusing to you, what I would recommend doing is let k be 2 see how everything squares out. But again, if you've ever seen a covariance, you've done this problem before. Yeah. Yes, yes, yeah, 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 yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Not even intentional. So I always forget to square. So there we go. Yes, you're right. So square that thing. So again, how do you do this? Write down that linearization, that first order term, plug it in, expand everything, and you'll see everything just from that. If you like induction, then you can butter that up and see what happens on third, fourth, and fifth. Um, where K is three fourths. Okay, so that's what the book kind of carries you through. And I would say these are all delta method preliminaries. These are just approximations. We haven't said anything about what T is yet, and so we just know this stuff is true. So kind of close. Now let me show you what the delta method is. Okay, so these are just preliminary steps. Calc 101. First calculus lesson, 
was maybe the, something they should have done with it. So here's the delta method. And it says this. If root n y n minus theta on you just a little bit. They go from t to yn. So this is the random variable we were talking about. So in our delta method preliminaries, this is going to be t, just our random variable. But we're denoting that it's a function of n sample size. So that's sample size. So you can think of it as t, but remember that it's a function of n. So if this happens, normal, zero, sigma squared, we set a statement very similar to this before. I took the sigma out, and I divided it by sigma, and you can do that, that's fine. Sigma is just a constant, I can float it to both sides of the equation. We have to be a little bit more careful with the root ends, though. It's where we're taking the limits. And I'll butcher a proof for you so that you can see it matters where we put the root ends. And then I'll do the proof correctly for you. So if you don't understand why it's so important where we put the ends in everything. So this is basically just a statement of some sort of a limit theorem where we converge to this normal distribution. We've got a really good example. We discussed different limit theorems for a little while that Sometimes we get these sort of normal tendencies when we're not dealing with the average per se. So there could be some amount of correlation in things. But if I had IID data, XI coming from F with variance of the XI's being finite, and I happen to be interested in the mean, I goes from one to N, I usually call that X bar but this would be an example of yn where this happens. So example where this limit holds. So in our case, this would be yn right here. If I substituted x bar for this, the statement is true. So where do we usually use the delta method? While it doesn't say that we have to impose it on the central limit theorem, it's certainly useful in those cases, and that's where most people use this. Okay, so if this is true, and we know a lot of cases where this statement is true, then square root n g y n minus g theta goes to a normal zero g prime <coughs> theta bless you squared sigma squared. That's the delta method. And it's not surprising. If you took home the preliminaries and you understand them and you get all that, what's the variance of this whole thing? Well, it's just the same scale multiplier. And I buried in the same results right here. So where am I using the expectation? Right there. So that same preliminary. And so if I said the original random variable was normally distributed, then you might be inclined to say, well, then my transformed random variable is normally distributed with the means and the variances that we already wrote down. And it turns out it's true. That's kind of cool. So let me just say that one more time. We've got our mean and our variance. G theta. 
and we've got our variance, g prime theta squared, times the variance of the random variable. I'll write down t again. So my expectation is approximately that, and my variance is approximately this thing right here. So if my original random variable has mean, theta, variance, whatever it is, maybe in our case, we think of it as sigma squared over n for x bar, then what's the distribution of some arbitrary transformation? I haven't put a lot of conditions on g other than I can take some derivatives of it, which I did say it's pretty well behaved and smooth. And so when I take my transformation and it's still normally distributed, at least in the, in the limit. So let's just remember this means this n goes to infinity. And so while this might converge very, very fast under some number of samples, I want to point out that while asymptotically they're both converging at the same rate, they're not actually just as close to each other for any finite sample size. So this might be happening faster or slower in practicality usually slower. Okay, so if your approximation is a little weak here, then your approximation is probably weak. Probably need a proof of this. And it's not too difficult. Let me show you a butcher proof, and then we'll fix the proof. Any questions before I move on? This smacks of 1950s statistics it is. So this is stuff people could have done a very long time ago. They did. I'm going to have you play around with it. I don't think it's enough to just write down the theorem, take a limit, and say that it's true to understand how well this thing works. I think you have to play around. So what I'm going to ask you to do on a future homework is compare under some estimation problem bootstrapping and delta method. And I'm going to build one more method in. I'm going to teach you about phase before you do it. And so I'm going to give you three different tools, and you can study in various scenarios how well those tools work. So one tool is a purely computational thing, bootstrapping. One tool is this asymptotic tool, works under big N. And then one tool is going to be a conditional tool. We'll get to that next time. So we'll start our phase class next time. OK, so proof. And I'll say this is butchered. This is an incorrect proof. Here's my remainder. We are making assumptions about G, three significant ones. We can take derivatives over it. So it's smooth, fairly well behaved. So it doesn't distort all of that normality. It's good to remember what these terms look like. So the remainder involves terms. like these, yn minus theta raised to some power, i, or i is greater than 2, greater or equal to 2. Just keep that in mind. So throughout this whole butcher group, which is just one or two more lines. And so let me just ask, what happens as yn goes to theta? So as yn goes to theta, what happens to the remainder? Zero, because of those terms that we wrote down. 
You don't even have to worry about it with these powers. That power messes up. They're bigger than one. So if yn's are going to theta, then yn's going to theta raised to a power greater than one goes faster. So these things will go to zero even faster. When I start making those powers less than one, then I have to be careful with what I just did. They make small numbers get big. But we're bigger than two. Rn goes to zero. So we can kind of see already the, the remainder is going to disappear on us. Okay. So let's just take a limit. So here's my butchery. So this is the butchery step. Limit G Y N N goes to infinity. So it's like G theta. Nothing happened there. I'm going to mess everything up right here by doing this. But this is going to be plus G prime theta. I'm just going to write it out. Here's the butchery step. So this doesn't actually work for us. It doesn't do what we hope that it does. But we'll fix it in just a second. Plus limit n goes to infinity rn. We know what this does. Somebody argue to me real quickly why that goes to zero. yn doing as n gets bigger. It keeps getting closer and closer to theta. Why? Because of our original statement. And so root n yn minus theta is to a normal zero sigma squared. Right here. These are getting closer and closer. This is a statement about the central limit theorem. Think about what means do. Things like yn here. So means keep getting more and more concentrated and the variance is driving towards zero. And so I'm going towards the truth. If you don't like that and that's a little bit overkill, we glob large numbers so that it goes to the mean. So do you like to use weaker arguments? So this thing right here, yn is going to theta in the limit. And that's true, certainly true. So rn goes to zero and so this, I would say, this looks normally distributed. So where does it center? No problem right there. What's the variance of all of this? Well, the way that I've written it down, you're inclined to do this. Sigma squared keeps getting smaller and smaller and smaller. And that's why the mathematician won't like this very much. Because when I take this limit right here, yeah, it's becoming normally distributed. Why is starting to look more and more normal? If I drew the histograms of these things for bigger and bigger n, it looked more and more normally distributed. And they'd be centered around theta. And the variance would be getting squished. And so when I take the limit of this thing, incorrect mathematical argument, is this goes to zero. Which doesn't make any sense. Because that's not a distribution anymore. And so we're trying to say something distributionally. And so what I'm going to do right here is I'm going to pull this n out of all of this equation and get rid of the n on the right-hand side right here. And so how am I going to do that? I'm going to multiply everything by root n. Remember, the variance is I multiply by something that gets squared. So if I pull up the n, shove it in as a root n, it gets squared and it'll do the canceling for me. So let's write that down. Saying that, I think this is how I thought about it the first time I saw it. It's like normal, it goes to that. You plug in the end right here. No big deal, I'm good with it. And then later on, I sympathized with my professors and I thought, it doesn't make any sense. So if you're really thinking of it as a distribution. 
So let's just look at this. Limit n goes to infinity root n. And if you want to make the statement look a little bit more like what we wrote down the claim was, you can subtract off the g theta right now. Or you can leave it in there. It doesn't matter. So plus, I'll say this is going to go to, this is equal, limit g theta, You've still got g theta, I'll just keep it on the right hand side. So plus g prime theta derivative. And now I've got this root n in here. Root n that I had to take care of in this whole thing. Um, and you can put in the root n all over the place. Y n minus theta right here, plus take our limit. over the entire thing, and I'll have my root n, rn right here. So as I slide this through, a little bit of a contamination problem right here. What do we do to take care of it? Rip it off to the other side. Now we're gold. Now we've got that statement. So I don't like taking an end when it blows up on me. And now it's all very balanced over here. So I just pulled it over to the other side. Now we just have this term. And I know what this does to the limit. This is just normal, zero, sigma squared. And I have to do a quick analysis of the last term. And I'm going to say this goes to zero. How do I do it? I go back and I look at these terms right here. How fast are these going to zero? And just multiplying by root n contaminate everything. The answer is no. After you analyze this and you see what happens as a function of n, this still goes to zero. And they'll argue that through the book as well. But now we've got our statement. Because this whole thing right here is a normal zero g prime theta squared. This is a variance. Sigma squared over n. Oh, and I should have, oh, and we're good to go. Got rid of the n, that was the whole point. Delta. I'll say this, since we have two minutes, this is how you use the delta method. So, we've written down a proof, but this is what we do at the end of the day. data center it there, whatever it is you're trying to understand. I'll say YN. Looks like this. G prime theta squared variance YN. And if you don't know this, you approximate it. in our central limit theorem, maybe that's sigma squared over n. You don't know sigma squared. And so what do you do for it? You approximate. If you want minus 1, go for it. Seven, we'll be discussing point estimators. So, sigma squared half turns out this one is closer on average. This one is unbiased. 
but the variance is still an issue. And so that's what we do with it, we kind of plug everything just in and use it in this kind of finite edition. And we'll plug in n. And so my butchered proof looks a lot how we use the delta method. But I'm plugging into everything. And then we have to clean it up so it, mass it passes the mathematical test. And so on a test, I would be asking you, maybe show me why this remainder is going to zero and argue that, something like that. So I might be a little bit specific. On a qualifying exam, I might say prove the delta method. And what I'm really looking for is are you meticulous in all of your steps? For a final exam here, I'm going to look for partial meticulousness. So there's lots of engineers here. You've understood it all kinds of different ways. I don't know if the nuance matters to you, but it makes it correct. But we can still use it regardless. So anyway, we'll come back next time. I want to show you where the delta method fails. Let me just point to one thing real quickly. What happens if g prime is 0? Busted. So collapse. Delta method doesn't work at all. I want to talk about examples where the delta method does not work well, where it fails explicitly, and how you can fix that up. Just a little bit of examples for next time. And then I'll warm you up to the example that you'll be doing a simulation study on. So if you want to get started over the weekend on bootstrapping that example, doing the delta method, you don't have to wait for the phase edition to come up. That's it for now, guys. Thanks so much. How's your confidence? Yeah. Good? Yeah. Good. That's what I want to hear.